up and uh, and please welcome Troy Linder and Larry Dahlberg for the hunt for big fish. Well, Troy and I discussed this earlier and we decided that uh, we're going to do like a question and answer thing. But what I have to t I em embarrass Troy for a minute first. Absolutely. Yeah, no problem. The last time I was with this young man, it spent any length of time we were in a boat together, and he was about this tall. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. And we were snagging quillback carp suckers. Yeah. And the best time of year for that is from when to when? Uh, that's a good question. Now, uh, you can catch fish on frogs all year, but uh, where it really, really gets significant, and then where uh, where you need something that says frog really loud is in the fall. Where there, well, actually two times. In the summer, after the first hatch of frogs happens, there's a monstrous migration of frogs. I used to go at Brainerd, remember yeah. where we used yeah. to live? The hockey rink? Yes, the hockey, yeah, yeah, yeah. And those frogs would come out of that big pond, and I could go with a cooler, a big Coleman cooler, and literally fill it with frogs. We'd lay it down, and me and the dog, and my kids would chase these things up against the edge of the hockey rink. They'd jump in the cooler, bring them, and then I'd uh, bring them out into the, you know, that was a very good time. And then you'd get a cooler full of frogs, put a frog, uh, straw up their butt, inflate them like a golf ball, and then pitch 50 or 60 of them off into the slop bed, and then wait. And it just, it's... Yeah, I, uh, the, first, uh, the first article I ever did was frogging for bass. I think I was 10 at the time. And I remember going up to Canada with my dad and catching, I, I caught a frog in the bank, and we were fishing walleye. You know, can I, I want to throw this, because I frog a lot. For, we'd catch them on the shore. They, they're, they're everywhere at Brainerd. And I remember catching 10 walleye on one frog. Good frog. Out there. And, and I always thought of going, like entering the PWT. And because none of the, they're all live bait, you know, at the time. And I thought of always using, like, and I think I talked to some of the guys about Scarless or something at the time. Like, what do you think about a frog? Like, now nah, I just throw a leecher and frog. I'm like, what about a frog? After catching ten, it was ten walleyes on one frog, and I was just my dad was like oh, shaking his head. <laughs> but that was interesting. Uh, last fall, I'm fishing with Patrick Sabil, the Sabil guy, at the at the entrance of a creek where there's a little bit of a lagoon-like -like thing. I caught a walleye about ten. I wanted dinner. I ate it. When I cleaned it, there were six giant frogs in it, which is the next answer in the fall. Well, the, when they come to go to sleep, it isn't like one over here and one over here. They all go to the same place, and the fish know exactly where that place is, and it usually doesn't make a damn bit of sense because it doesn't relate to the steep yeah. drops. But what you find is an outside band of a river channel that's adjacent to a flat, soft bottom, muddy spot, and you look at the, you just watch the horizon, look at the horizon, you'll find a crack. Always there will be a crack that leads to the place where the frogs sleep in the winter. It's a really good place to fish. And, and about the only place, well, we don't have walleye out here, the only place to get slop walleye. <laughs> <laughs> and I, have, I don't have a whole lot of experience with the A-Rig, but you're hearing more and more everything like the suspended, suspended bass and A-Rig is now going together, even though it's like you've all of a sudden like discovered in all these lakes like these suspended bass of Pira, uh, they've been there all the time. And I believe it's, I don't know what your take on this would be, but maybe the drawing power, the, the size of the bait or something like that that's triggering them. The question is, why did they suspend? Sometimes bass suspend because they're eating insects. Sometimes bass suspend because they're eating smaller pelagic bait that eats insects. Sometimes bass suspend to get the hell off of the spot where you guys are all beating the crap out of it. And they go suspend out there because they just as soon not have you around. If that's the case, you ain't going to catch them. You might be able to catch them on a, on a crankbait, a rattle trap, something that's running. But the odds are probably pretty low if the reason they're suspended is because you scared them off where they wanted to be. If they're biting on, uh, if they're, a lot of, you'll, you'll see this in many lakes, I know in the Canadian Shield we see this a lot, where uh, in the evening you watch the carpet come up off the bottom, yeah. and this yeah. is a, a mayfly called a hexagenia lumbata, and when they do that, those fish can get up and they just hang there, and the best way to catch is with a damp bobber and a hair jig, or a little crappie type jig, a little fly, and you got to put it in their face, and they just come up and go, like that. Otherwise, if they're chasing us, 
pelagic stuff. An Alabama rig, something that, since you don't know where they are, and there's nothing that lets you relate to where they are other than spotting them on your depth finder, you need something you can throw a mile. It has a ton of attracting power and is roughly the same size as the creatures that they're eating. In some of the, the smallmouth waters, a lot of times they'll be out there catching smallmouth, but you can't read them on the graph because of, they're so high up. And a lot of times, and I've seen this, casting out for the smallmouth, the smallmouth are about four feet under the boat. <laughs> They're right below the boat. You won't read them on the graph. And if you're in clear water, they got a big shade. They got a moving shade. And they go like that, and they're sitting right underneath the boat. And what? No. I don't know how, far, how much. No, you don't want to go into any more detail. <laughs> okay. Probably. You're getting too close to home. All right. All right. But something <laughs> small. Something that's something. small and non-threatening. How about yeah. that? Yeah. Right underneath the boat. And it has to be within a cube of space that's probably four by four inches in front of their face. And the only thing they have to be able to do to eat it is go, and if it takes more than, they ain't going to eat it. If it's real non-threatening, good. If it's too big, threatening, ain't going to happen. If it's got a lot of mass, they go, and it won't go in. It's got to have a very, very low mass. That would work. Yeah, absolutely. A one-inch fluke is probably as close to an imitation of a mayfly as anything that you can get. They swim. And also, the sink rate is really important. It's got to sink really, really slow. I've been making lures since I was about this big on account of we didn't have any money or access. So, uh, man, really, quite often, I will get up at 3.30 in the morning and make a lure from scratch, make the mold, pour the head if it's lead, and I'll be fishing with it by 6.30 a.m. Got everything right there, it's really easy. Yeah? Do you think gravel ever made it lighter, small, a smaller type of mining for bass? That's a really hard thing to do. That's a very, very difficult thing to accomplish. Uh, the closest thing right now that you could get that they make, and you might be surprised, you get a CD7 or a CD5, rip the lip off it, and just cast it and work it real twitchy. And it'll shoot around and glide quite well. But that's a really hard thing to do because you don't have much inertia. And it's got a, a, a gliding bait has to overcome the line resistance. And so... You have a really, really, really light line, and uh, the, the distance, uh, part of making a, a glide bait glide is giving it a just a pop, not a stroke. And uh, a little, a lightweight lure uh, in water, which is thick, uh, it's hard to pop it and get it to actually go very far. I personally got a braid for just literally everything. Uh, fluorocarbon, personally, uh, I, you know, I read all the stuff. I understand refractive indexes and so on and so on. But a uh, line is round, it means it's a lens. If you have light pass through it, it's going to have an effect. Now, you can film fluorocarbon underwater, you can see it quite well. If it was square, you can't see it at all because there's no lens effect. Yeah. yeah. I use it for leaders, for abrasion, uh, but I use almost all braid for everything. For, for big swim baits, I like monofilament. Grew up fishing mono, and it seems to be, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I had no problem catching, everybody had no problem catching big fish then. <laughs> well, the difference, though, is I like to, I cast really long casts. Like, I throw it as far as I can throw it literally every, every single time. And, I mean, I'm throwing it 80, 90 yards. And at the end of a bomber cast with mono, it's a mother to get the hook set. Uh, mono will stretch up to 30% of... Braid stretches 3%. Uh, Kevlar only stretches 1%. That's why it breaks. But that's it's the hook setting. And then also if you're fishing in much of uh, saltwater fish, obviously braid gives you so much more line capacity. What you do is sacrifice knot strength. And uh, what I would do, uh, where I'd use 30 pound mono, I'd use 65 pound braid. <laughs> I guess at places like, that have a lot of brush, like at, at some of the Southern Cal Lakes, if I'm up on a point of throwing out, like a braid with a floral leader, I like the angle with the floating of the braid that it, as it goes down, and those brush are coming uphill, the way it sits, and at the end of it, it kind of makes that bend 
like that. So you have the parade up as fluorocarbon. Obviously, it's sinking down into those trees. And if a, a fish bites at the bottom, at the bottom of the bush, it's got it. And if the, that, you know, the line is laying down in there, you've got a better chance of that thing getting into one of those trees as you're trying to bring it up. Whereas the braid is a lot, uh, you know, it's much higher up in the water column. And at the end, with you know, depending on how long your your leader is, it's better for that type of fishing. It depends on the braid. You got all braids are gel spun polyesters. You got one is Dyneema and the other is Spectra. One of them floats, the other sinks. The floating braid. Uh, the, the question was a little bit about the wind at Havasu. And what I found there is I'm able to catch, you know, 14 to 16 pounds. I can get like three, three and a half pound smallmouth pretty regularly there, no matter what the day is. And, and uh, I was kind of, I was waiting three years because at the uh, 2009. It was in 2009, in the last day of the FLW, I switched the National Guard there. I switched. I was chasing all the largemouth. I got into the dock talk, and you got to fish the, the beds and this. And I said, forget it. I'm going to. I'm fishing smallmouth, and I changed. Uh, I changed gears and brought in a big bag of smallmouth. I had to wait three more years to try that again. So, what? And I figured also at Havasu is you have an interesting thing that happens there. And Havasu is it's a it's a party lake. I mean, everybody knows it's it's spring break. There's gonna what what happens at Havasu stays at Havasu. But what what happens on the weekend there, the Saturday Sunday boat traffic there compared to pre-fish. And I knew it was gonna happen. I knew this going in. I, I, I knew it. This I said this is gonna be perfect. It's a Thursday Friday Saturday tournament. Boat traffic. If you had it in the graph, you know. There's, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I knew it was going to get tougher every single day. And I knew that those fish, when people were in the in the marinas fishing, those bedding fish, said, you're going to have so many boats coming in and out of there. And, and you're going to have jet skis, you're going to have all this. So trying to avoid those packed marinas. So what I did is I tried to find smallmouth in the main lake basin on some of those points and some of those areas around the mouth of the river and targeting just sort of the the less, I don't like to fish around a lot of boats as it is, so I found some of the less pressured smallmouth and targeted them, just that some of those marinas, they were saying there's there's 20 boats in there and, and you're looking at a guy catching a fish and that can get in your head and you're, you're paying attention to all these other boats when you should be looking at your cast and focusing on where you're fishing and you're distracted by these 10 boats, especially if a guy catches the fish, you're like, oh, I'm looking over there, looking at this guy and you're not you're not 100% committed to every single cast. Um, and the, the, the big bag was on, I was just fishing some transitioning smallmouth that were coming up coming up to bed. And I found them throwing jerk baits. I was throwing a bright orange X-wrap in practice. It just I just wanted them to show themselves. That was the main thing there. Where do these small, they love, like smallmouth like shiny, bright objects. So do I. <laughs> And, and kind of locating them and figuring out where they're going to spawn, at least on the points and where they're moving in from. And I was fishing in practice. I wasn't fishing. I was fishing in the tournament where they were going to, not where they were coming from. So when the tournament came, I knew that all those guys that I see in the marinas locating those fish, I said, that's going to get really, really tough. So that's why my weights each day kind of increased. And then I, I had a couple big bites in the last day on a bed. I had to work a fish for an hour. I had to hide behind it was, it took me, I took the 15 minute, it was, I got two fish off of one bed. I caught a, I caught a four pounder off it, and I seen a five pounder getting ready to move up, so it went up. I looked at it, and I had to hide behind this, I was hiding behind this bush and casting to it, and finally it turned away, and I, and I got it after an hour. I would make, every 15 minutes I would come around, if it saw the boat out too high, it would come off the bed and look at me. So I tried to hide as much as I can, and that was the second biggest fish I got there. But that was, that's kind of, you know, it was going in there trying to find fish that nobody was fishing. So, uh, the bait was on a flutter worm and a spade tail worm. Two fish in the last day were on beds. Three fish that I weighed in were just on a point transitioning to, to a flat where they were going to spawn. Just casting it out, weightless, weightless, weightless flutter worm, four inch, casting it out. Just watching the slack, like that. And it was that, and it was braided with a floral leader. Suffix a 32, 20 pound with an 8 pound suffix floral leader. And on the drop shot, same thing, braid leader. 
question was, do you fish fiberglass? Uh, I personally never do for crankbaits or anything else. I don't have any trouble at all. Uh, if I fish in a trap, I'll take the rear hook and throw it away. And put on one size bigger one in the front. Bait works just as good. If they jump, they don't get off. Uh, there isn't a really standard for me. It depends on what I'm doing. So I was fishing bass, I might start out with four feet, cut it back till it gets short enough that I <laughs> do it again. I use that uh, PT knot. Blade or blade or floral. Double all bright. It won't go through the guides. You mean a double nail? Double all. I, 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 I don't go through the guides with it. I usually fish yeah. about three to four yeah. feet where it's not. That is the problem with that. What, especially with the new micro guides and some of those, yes. it catches and that's annoying. So that's my, my leader length is enough where it doesn't go up into the guides. No. no. I try not to sometimes if I'm fighting a fish or it's coming next to the boat. but. Especially with the new micro guys and a lot of the rods that catch. It's a that pain. It's it's a, yeah, it's a bad deal. You guys fish the micro guys? I don't like them. I used to fish them, but I don't like them anymore. Uh, oh, half and half. If you pull really, really hard, you, you go out up here, you pull really hard, there's a great deal of uh, a lateral torque, and uh, those things, I've ripped them right off of rods on, you know, pulling really hard on fish. And again, if you're using a long leader, there's nothing worse than you're cranking that thing up and you're going to make another cast really, really quick. It goes, and you got four feet. Yeah, that, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I've had two, yeah, you yeah, go to right, cast, yeah. you go to cast, and, you go to cast, yeah. and then it yeah. burns the nest. Yeah. But if the, the, knot, the PT knot's worth learning to tie. You can, uh, it'll hold, it's 100% strength, and Albright's only 60. And uh, you Still can learn it in your life. <laughs> I test everything. I, I got testers and crap, and I don't believe anything anyone says until I test it. Yeah. I like what you said about reaction bites yesterday, and I got to thinking, I've never seen you fish like what we consider a finesse technique. Are there any finesse techniques that you utilize? Oh, sure. All the same ones you guys use. I fished bass all my life. I was a guide for 23 years for smallmouth, and I did a lot of fly fishing. And the, 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 the ultimate fin finesse technique is fly fishing. That is ultimate finesse technique. Drag-free drifts, all that kind of stuff. Now, that there's a creature that we didn't talk about. We're talking about suspended fish and bugs. One of the least fished things that fish eat most, all sizes, bass species in particular, are dragonflies.